We don't have time to um, use toys instead of tools. We have to buy the best available tools for these people. And uh, every time we look, it comes out SGI. Today, I wanted to show you my SJ Octane, a rather high-end workstation from Silicon Graphics that came out around 1996-1997, coming with 295 megahertz R10064 bit MIPS processors. And we love Octane. As far as I know, when this system came out in 1997, it probably costed around 50,000 US dollar. At least this is what I found on the internet. It's very easy to use and it's doing a lot to change the way we do business here and it is years ahead of the competition. There's nobody else out there that has this tool available. I obviously brought it use 10 years after that in 1996 for way less than that. For my non x86 Linux development involvements, I was always interested in more interesting architectures like PowerPC, Spark and MIPS and was working on and with the systems decades ago. As an engineer, we need high performance workstations and models that took me about an hour and a half to run on my Indigo 2 Impact, I can now complete in a half hour. This is why I got this to develop and test Linux, MIPS and MIPS64 with Rock Linux and what later became our T2 system development environment. Unfortunately, when I brought it, I could never get it to work stable with a heavily reverse engineered Linux port back in the day. It was unfortunately parked in my basement for the last nine years. And only some retro and vintage videos on YouTube recently inspired me to get it out of the basement and running again. And actually over Christmas and New Year, I got it running more stable than ever on Linux, not only with the latest GCC, GLibc and quite new Linux kernel, 10 years ago, the Linux kernel port was around 2.6.19. And as far as I remember, the longest it would boot and run a Linux kernel was some minutes or maximum 10 or 15 minutes until it would crash. And now with all the patches updated and, and redift and rebased to 4.12, it is running actually quite stable for hours. So stable, I've never personally seen it run. At the front, it has a rather interesting door that can be snapped in at the side where you could have some tape drives or disk drives. Unfortunately, I never had this plastic cover. This is a drawback when you buy expensive systems uh, with huge discount on eBay and some plastic parts are missing. Power button and reset switch. The front cover comes off like this. And as you see, it has a rather heavy metal case. I think some parts are even cast iron and it weighs nearly 25 kilograms. Here in the middle, you find three SCSI bays, which unfortunately I also only have one bay for. And when I would go to eBay and buy parts like this, you can, you can easily spend nearly as much for single parts as I spent for the whole unit uh, 10 years ago. Some parts like this on the frame I think are cast iron and probably also explains the weight. As I said, 25 kilograms, this thing is rather heavy. The setup is rather flexible. The SGA Octane has a high performance crossbar switch on the front back plane where all these modules um, slot in with rather fragile IBM compression connectors. Here on this empty slot was a video capture board that I took out the other week. This is some video capture broadcasting board that I guess few other people have. I did not ask for this and actually initially the reverse engineered Linux port would hang on boot due to this board until we figured out that I think the frame buffer driver was trying to uh, to access this video board um, because it didn't check the ID or something. Here you can see the curious and rather fragile IBM compression connectors that you should not touch and not try to complain with conventional methods. I heard they are rather fragile and prone to fail and all the boards connect to the back plane using this high frequency, high bandwidth connectors. So if you uh, get one of those, don't clean, don't touch, don't do anything to them. Surprisingly, I never had an issue, but um, I would not try and risk it. I only took this board out um, because I thought maybe this is causing stability issues. After spending so much time, I thought maybe better check if this board is causing any of the issues. However, it didn't make a change um, in regards to stability. However, I noticed the fence would run less loud after I took it out. So now as I have no need and obviously not a reverse engineered Linux driver for this, I leave it out because the fans are too loud anyway and everything that keeps the fans running more quiet is an added bonus. The only drawback is I have no cover for these compression connectors. 
also inside on the back plane and of course it doesn't look so nice with this open slot right now there are not even slot covers for sale on ebay and if you find some they easily cost as much as i spent for the hulu octane so for the time being i leave this empty this video capture board by the way connected with this um, three ribbon cables here to the um, main graphic card if you have a use for this sgi video capture thing let me know i probably could sell it to you or change it with some other parts that i might find more interesting so connector wise uh, sgi is actually quite well equipped especially for video audio it comes with a regular headphone and speaker jack it has line in and out and corks and optical SPDIF, which i actually find quite interesting and actually in contrast to some intel max where the optical input does not work on most models in um, linux this actually do work in the reverse engineered Linux driver. What interesting is that this optical SPDIF outputs support a rather rare and interesting studio format, some aided optical 8 channel mode that nobody had hardware for and is neither implemented nor tested with a reverse engineered Linux driver. But I guess it's only some bits to turn on so and this PCM streams to wire out to the other interface. So if you have some need for this with some good kernel knowledge, I would expect that it can be made working in a weekend or two. SCSI connector, Ethernet, kind of small size uh, parallel port and standard PS2 keyboard and mouse and three ports. And the graphic cards, there are two generations of options. The older impact board also shared with older SGI machines that have a working basic X driver that is however not making use of any hardware acceleration and the newer vpro boards that are interesting in itself because they have OpenGL on a chip meaning they interpret some OpenGL command stream and run all the OpenGL stuff like kind of natively in the hardware. Needless to say, SSGI was on the forefront of 3D technology and developed and invented most of this kind of systems and application programming interfaces like OpenGL. So they had kind of OpenGL running directly in the hardware. While the Wii Pro are the higher performance ones and sound more interesting, it only has a basic rather slow frame buffer as it is drawing all the pixels with GL quads. And there is not an X driver because um, details of DMA and things like this are not figured out. So besides there are currently not really many active developers for this, there is also not enough reverse engine known to write a even moderately working X driver. So this lower performance impact boards are preferable for Linux because at least you have a not that high performance, but at least working uh, X driver. While I took all of this out the last weeks and it's still working, I do not want to risk this today. So I will save a disassembly of this for the next video. So best subscribe to see this. Now I will connect it and show you booting and Linux and more disassembly and other notes are then coming in the next videos. Why were it? Um, as many Unix workstations from this era, the graphic is connected with some 13W3 connector that is analog VGA. So you you cannot plug in a monitor directly. However, there are this commonly available 13W3 adapters to VGA. They also work with Sun Microsystems and other machines. However, this may not work with each display. I heard that the SGI are sync on green. I only used it with two of my displays that I have here in stock. I did not try the Dell 4K. However, it makes no sense as the output resolution is not high enough. However, it works with both my old ViewSonic and the NEC Multisync. I think most displays should work, but be warned that this may be sync on green and your mileage may vary. As I already mentioned, the fans make quite some noise and the 10,000 RPM SCSI hard drive is contributing further to that. When I brought this a decade ago, I actually was surprised by the size and weight and noise. I imagined it slightly smaller, less heavy and less noisy. So if you were thinking buying this kind of vintage systems, be aware of such details. So, unlike the text BIOS on PCs back in the day, those high-end workstations already had graphic uh, firmware management. Normally the system would have just booted, I cancelled the automatic boot. You can also enter some command monitor here, where you can set variables similar to open firmware and such, and also do network boot already. So if I would uh, call your boot p like this, it would load the Linux kernel from the TFTP server. However, in the meantime, I finally got the system set up so that it would automatically boot Linux as well.
and this is 64-bit MIPS booting on this SGI Octane. And actually, as far as I know, pretty much nearly everything is working, except graphic is not fully accelerated. So this is the most stable setup I ever had. Actually, to get this working that stable again, I actually had to cross-compile plenty of system routes. I spent really quite some time over Christmas and New Year to find a stable combination because there is 32-bit, 64-bit, then there is N32, which is 64-bit registers and processor features with 32-bit pointers, which has slightly higher performance. And then I had to forward port patches and accumulate patches that others already forward ported and, and rediffed. Um, I now have also Linux 4.12 running rather stable, um, everything works. And the funny thing is that right now I'm most likely the only person who has Linux running that full featured right now, because even other people who forward ported and uh, rediff patches, for example in Gen 2, do not have sound working. I fixed uh, the Linux ISO driver in, in various ways. Later I found that actually the PCI bridge that is also on the crossbar switch can actually swap the endiness for DMA transfers. So then I improved the sound driver to make use of this feature again. Even getting the sound driver fully working again took half of a day with debugging and testing. I even tested optical SPDIF out with my own digital analog converter board. This is also a latest GCC um, 7.2, something more readable for the camera. And the latest uh, GLIPC in higher performance N32, 2.26. However, in the meantime, I already built a new sys root with a slightly older compiler, GCC 4.9, I think, was the oldest that would compile the latest glibc because when you compile something natively, it is rather slow right now. These are only 195 MHz dual processor, which is obviously in today's standards not that fast. So I will probably rather install a slightly older GCC to have over 20% faster compilation if I compile something locally here. Actually all of this system is 99% cross-compiled with T2 on a data center server. So this cross-compiles in only an hour or two depending which compiler you use and then I rsync it to the system which is obviously way faster than compiling natively which easily takes a week or so on the system. I only compiled a few things natively like Perl and uh, maybe Blackbox but everything else the whole X server is cross compiled and another funny thing I took a little bit extra time to hack preliminary hardware cursor support because the impact X driver is using software cursor which is obviously rather slow and flickery to make most use of the hardware resources I wanted a hardware cursor. However, I currently cannot change the cursor shape, so this is why this is a rather funny looking cursor that is loaded by the firmware. If I ever wanted to change the hardware cursor icon, I have to reverse engineer more how to load this into the video chip there of the impact board. So if you want to have fun with vintage systems, systems like this can be rather fun. The build quality is of course uh, really interesting. However, be aware that for some systems there may be rather few people in the world uh, doing this so right now. There may be, my estimate, five or ten people who have SGI Octane stuff running with Linux. So if you run into problems, you are most likely the only one who needs to figure out what is the problem and how to get it to work. But aside from this, it can be fun. However, the prices increase. So if you right now want to buy such a system on eBay, it's probably 200 US dollars for an entry level system, which even has more parts broken and scratched and may not come with keyboard and mouse. Fun fact is, a decade ago, my Octane came with a full software library. So I have the whole IRIX 6.5 that should probably be possible to install again from scratch. Maybe I try this in another video soon. Running the original RX has the benefit of having all the hardware drivers running accelerated and, and write, so you have the full original SGI um, OpenGL stack, which is obviously also helpful for reverse engineering. And now that I have running Linux that well on this machine, I will probably in the future install a dual boot setup uh, with RX. I hope you found this video interesting. For me, it was uh, certainly quite a nice throwback to my early 
getting Linux cross-compiled and all the ARM, PowerPC, MIPS and Spark bits and all this kind of areas I was touching and working on. I have more videos like this planned, not only about the SGI Octane, which I will still disassemble and certainly install RX on. I also have other systems from back in the day. So if you're interested in such kind of vintage computing, but also um, today's IT topics, don't forget to subscribe for plenty of videos to come this year.